Croatia LA. Um, I've been here for about 13 years, and I'm really excited to have this program. It was inspired by the incredible success of the Women's Power Program, which was created by Dahlia. And she was a lot of suggestions from the ladies, like, okay, we're learning how to be amazing partners. There's only one problem. What's the problem? It takes two to tango. It takes two to tango. We got these chubby guys over here. No one knows how to do what, you know? So they made us promise to start a program for the guys as well, and this is the program. So here in the second week, uh, we're going to start to need sign-ups, just so you guys know, uh, including the dinner, the mentorships, the different uh, components. It's just $10 a week, so it just covers our cost. Um, so please sign up. This week we are doing another group class, but we're going to start next week to bring people up into smaller groups with individualized mentors, okay? So we're going to do that, and then every few weeks we're going to shift the mentors so you get a chance to be with everyone and meet everyone. Uh, just very quick announcements on ja, uh, June 1st, okay, on a Wednesday night in about two weeks, we are having the HLA Gala Banquet, and we are honoring our very own Josh Goldschmidt. And he calls Isaac the Woo! Two people that give their heart and souls for you. So please come and show them how much you appreciate them, like we appreciate them. Please sign up, HLA.com. Um, you guys can come for yourselves, not just for them. It's an amazing event. Seriously. Yeah, it's an amazing event. We have like a thousand people there, and it's, it's an amazing event. We have a guy who's giving a, a TED Talk that has over 5 million viewers. Yeah. Serious guy. Okay, and lastly, we have Summer Israel Trip leaving on June 28th. Okay, we have a ton of girls. The guys are a little bit hard to commit, if you know what I mean. This is what the girls always like, complain about. I'm like, I know, I feel it too. You know? Okay, the guys are always trying to think of options. We're going to the very last minute, okay? So please, please, I'd love you guys all to be a part of the trip. And also get your friends. Anyone that you know that's been on this trip has had one of the most amazing experiences of their lives. It's very worthwhile to introduce your friends to this experience and give them the gift of a lifetime. Any questions about the trip, please come see me afterwards. Okay, so let us begin. Did I miss anything? Pay, pay, please pay. Okay, so. Tonight's class is going to be focusing on how to deal with stress in your life. Okay, and I read an incredible article by a woman named Sarah Rigler. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen her. She is a very prolific author. She has many, many books. But she got me thinking. She wrote the article and she called the article, she called the title, God versus Prozac. Okay, that was an intriguing title for me because what she's kind of saying is a little bit pushed. Is she saying that God is like Prozac or we take Prozac because you don't have God, right? God versus Prozac. And that was a question I started to really think about. You know, what are the resources that living a more connected spiritual life offers us in this world? I think we all agree that we live high-stressed lives, yeah? Okay? Constant. Yes. What causes stress? Mind. Okay? Well, we create it. How do we create it? Expectations. Okay? So, what causes stress is feeling that you're under threat. <laughs> yes? Fear. What causes you to feel that you're under threat? What causes you to feel like you're under threat? Guys, do we live comfortable lives? Yeah. Unrealistic yes. expectations. Okay. One, expectations. The fact that our expectations are not filled makes us feel that where we're at now is lacking and therefore we have alarm signals going off. Danger, danger, danger. We're in danger. We don't have enough. We're not going to be enough. We're not going to make it. Okay, what else causes us incredible amounts of stress? Lack of instruction. Lack of what? Lack of guidance, lack of instructions about how to prioritize our time and our lives. 
and what's important. Yeah. Society pressure. Okay, so give me an example. Mm -hmm. Give me an example. Expectations to have this, to get married, or to... <laughs> so getting married is there. <laughs> so society pressure, all these obligations that are being dumped on you. And what I'm going to expand on that is, you know, having all of this, everything coming at you at once. Guys, we were in the jungle. And things started like attacking us on all sides. You know what we experienced? Fight or, Fight or flight. Our entire body was hijacked by hormones. Our hearts began to pump. Our brains shut down. We went, how do I survive? Okay? Now, was that life-saving in the jungle? In the jungles of, uh, of Jerusalem, right? Was that life-saving? Was that a life-saving uh, response? Yes, it could have saved your life. But right now, when we have this deadline, and we haven't answered this email, and this girl is trying to get me to marry her again, <laughs> and you know, I hear from all these things coming at us, and literally, every time, I don't know about you guys, you ever like feel your leg buzzing with the phone, and you just get this like complete knot in your stomach? Like, I can't handle one more thing in my, in my zone. I just can't, I can't absorb anything else. You're just dreading. Now, of course, we also have the opposite reaction. We're like, woo, you know, who is it? Like, who's coming, you know? Okay, but we have, even though, you know, we have so much freedom and so much luxury and so much ability and so much resources, we are constantly under siege because we are constantly, <coughs> constantly connected. Constantly, you know, I mean, it used to be that come seven o'clock, lights are out. What do you have, a candle? What do you have? So you know what you did at like seven o'clock every night? You went to bed. And now we're calling China. <laughs> Right? Now it's like, I gotta drive here, I gotta go there. I mean, it used to be that if you had to do something, or something, right? you had to go somewhere at night, you know what you would do? You would go to sleep and set out in the morning. But now we can jump on a plane and be somewhere. There's no downtime. 24 7, it's like daytime. And the world is open for business, correct? Is that just my life or everyone's life? Yeah? So that's constant input, constant pressure, constant stress, okay? It starts at young ages, and it goes through college, right? The bar, law school, right? Work. So there was a man named David Rose Marin, okay? He was a sophomore in college around the year 2000. And he was experiencing a tremendous amount of anxiety and stress, trying to grapple with all the all the tests and all the social pressures of being in college and all that, right? I don't want you guys, I went to Cornell and there was this thing called the pre prelim system. You guys have this or no? So I went to like the worst. <laughs> we had basically, instead of having a midterm and a final, we had three midterms and a final for each class. So I was constantly studying for a midterm. It was three of them. So it wasn't like one and one, it was three and one. Okay, so he was a sophomore. He began to feel unbelievably stressed, unbelievably anxious, okay? And it started to get to the point where he couldn't sleep at night. He was so wound up, his brain was going over a lot, over a because does anyone here have trouble falling asleep at night sometimes? Yeah. Yeah? yeah? Because your brain can't shut down, mm -hmm. because you feel like if your brain shuts down and you shut down, like something threatening is going to hit you and you're going to, right? You're going to die. Okay, so he was about to go to get medicated for his condition because you have to function, you have to sleep. Mm -hmm. And he happened to hear that there was a rabbi giving a class, and he told the rabbi that he was having this situation. The rabbi said, listen, I'm not a doctor, I'm not telling you whether or not to go on medication, but I have something I think can also help. And he handed him a book. Okay, the book was called uh, Shar B'Tachon. 
Okay, the gate of trust, it was called um, Duties of the Heart by Rabbi uh, Bechai. And basically, in this book, it told him how to live his life with a sense of security because he's not alone and he's not fully in control and there's a master plan and that which is happening to him is all happening to him for a reason and it's for the good. And the rabbi said to him, read this book 15 minutes a night. 15 minutes a night. And let me know in a few weeks if you feel like you've been affected for the better. So this guy was a completely not a religious guy. He like did nothing Jewish. He wasn't really raised with much Jewish identity. He decided he might as well skip the medication and see if this could help him. So he started reading and contemplating deeply the ideas in this book. And what he found is that the level of stress in his life started to dissipate. He was able to sleep. And after eight weeks, he found that even though he had more social pressure, harder exams, everything had gotten more intense, his ability to maintain a relaxed and confident posture in his life was incredible. Okay. So, he says, to my surprise, within eight weeks, not only was I able to fall asleep without difficulty, but my anxiety had almost completely vanished. Even more remarkable was that the improvement in my psychological state had occurred despite the fact that none of the anxiety-producing factors in my life had been changed. In fact, I was facing a grueling exam schedule, worse social woes than before, and I remained completely uncertain about my future. What had changed was my attitude toward my difficulties and towards life in general. I increased my level of trust in God and gained the spiritual accuracy necessary to navigate through the world of anxiety. In the same way that a medical patient faithfully places his hands, himself in the hands of a highly skilled physician, I realized that the events of my life were ultimately controlled by God's capable hands, and at the end of the day, I had little to worry about. Right? I wasn't alone. I had... I had help. Things are all happening for a reason. There's a purpose to it. So after graduation, he decided to enter into a master's in psychology. And what happened then is he kind of like, you know, stopped his, you know, religious little thing. But as he got closer to his graduation, the master's thesis, he started feeling the anxiety again. And he went back to this chapter in Rabbeinu Rabbein Baha'i's book. And he started to reread it, but this time, two years later, he started to reread it with the eyes of a psychologist. And when he realized that this was an incredible prescription to psychological well-being, okay? And he had basically stumbled onto a growing field of religious psychology. They answer questions such as, can religious beliefs help you to cope in times of stress? Does weekly attendance in religious related activities, are they linked to lower levels of anxiety and stress? Do religious people have better or worse outcomes with psychological treatments? Okay, can spiritual and religiousness be integrated into clinical practices for the treatment of psychological problems? So he decided to make it his life's work to start investigating these issues, right? So, there was a study which was done and reported in Canada's National Post by a man named Michael Inslicht. Okay, really, really interesting, guys. When I saw this, it blew me away. There's something called a Stroop test. You guys ever hear of that? Okay, it's a Stroop test. You know what it is? You said a group. Stroop, Stroop. Oh, no. Okay, it is some type of a test which creates an acute sense of stress because they throw like things out, you have to spread it, that creates an acute sense of stress. And they measure your brain waves in the part of your brain that experiences stress. Okay? So they were doing this group test, they were trying to figure out why some people were more immunitized to stress than other people. Some people felt stressed. 
stressed, right? And other people had much higher reserve before they felt very stressed. So they did the tests, and they saw there were some people that were more stressed and some people that were less stressed. And they started to investigate the people to find if they could, if they could identify the factors. So they tried to see if they were educated or less educated. They didn't find that there was any way of differentiating between their stress responses. Whether they were conservative or liberal, they didn't see any way of differentiating between their stress responses. Okay? They also looked at levels of self-esteem. Wouldn't you think that would have something to do with it? How good they feel about themselves, right? Levels of self-esteem. You know what they found? That didn't have any predictive factor as to whether they felt this stress response or not. You know what they identified as the most predictable factor of whether they felt stress or not? Yeah. It was faith in God. Only when the researchers asked about a belief in God and religiosity did they see a pattern develop. Those with the deepest religious beliefs were more likely to, make, to let mistakes roll off their backs, while those who tended toward atheism were more likely to suffer stress and anxiety after committing an error. This is just what the facts reported. This is just what they saw. Now listen to this army. You ready? So the professor reported that no atheist, not one atheist in the study, showed low anxiety. Every atheist had high anxiety. And not one religious person showed high anxiety. They all showed low anxiety. Now that's one test, guys. Can you extrapolate to the entire world from one test? Absolutely not. But this was a scientifically run test with controls and with this and with right. And what he found was something that was astronomical. Okay, he called this study statistically significant. And he said that the results could act as predictors to how people would react to real world stress situations. So this flies in the face of what psychologists have been saying for over 100, 150 years. So Freud himself, how did he view people and people that had a religious component to their personality, how did he view that? How did he view that psychologically? He the psychologically. What did Freud say? Delusion. Okay. Okay, he didn't say delusional actually. No. He said it was inversely associated with positive psychological health. So only the weak, psychologically unhealthy people would gravitate toward religion. But psychologically healthy people would be free of religion. That's what Freud said. Okay, one of the most esteemed psychologists in 1980, so how long ago was that? You know, 30 years ago, 35 years ago? He was ranked by his peers as the second most influential psychotherapist in history, Albert Ellis. He claimed that people who have strong religious convictions are going to have less tolerance for uncertainty, be less resilient, suffer more from anxiety, and be more prone to neurosis. This is in, 19, in the 1980s, okay? fairly recent. So religious people are cripples, emotional cripples, yeah. Can't there be a difference between other religions which are not like based on substance and the Jewish religion? Maybe they're so just focusing. So interestingly enough, really we're going to talk on, about yeah. Rosemary who started studying and what he found specifically the Jewish religion, but they find it's across the board. Oh, okay. They find it's across the board. It's not just Jewish religious belief. Yeah. Yeah. Does the level of religion make a difference? People that have deep-seated convictions. Well, I'm saying, like for example, like this, like Sinai Temple. I'm sure there's people that are very devout to Sinai, but not Orthodox. Like, does it make a difference which level of Orthodox Jews are there? It has more to do with their sense of amuna. Right? We're going to define amuna at the end, but amuna is your sense of connectivity and reliance on God. So people at Sinai feel very connected and relying on God. Yes. If they don't, it's more a social program, whatever. Then probably not. Yeah. I have two questions. Yeah. Well, I was going to actually ask specifically that because I've met a lot of religious people who are very, very stressed out. 
<laughs> no, <Not> really. <laughs> but I wonder, I would think if somebody's got a strong faith in God, then they're probably not honest as stressed. And I don't think the opposite of atheist is religious. I think the op opposite of atheist is believing in God. So is the test more about religion or your belief in God? Well, what he said was, let's see exactly what the, the study showed, according to the researcher. Those with the deepest religious beliefs. So maybe that was his own word. It's kind of vague. And then I would ask, yeah. I, again, like somebody who's stressful at 20 was probably stressful at 3 or 4. So maybe the people who are stressed out don't end up having a lot of faith in God because they're so stressed. And people who aren't stressed out and aren't anx have, don't have that anxious disposition end up having more faith in God. So are you saying that everyone's given a very strong God-based education and some people take to it and some people don't, or the opposite? No, I'm saying people okay. can be born with a different disposition and that, I could agree lead, with you. that could lead to their belief or lack of belief. Like if somebody's not an anxious person, then maybe, or a stressed out person from birth, then maybe they're, listen, you know, a happy-go-lucky and they have more amuna versus somebody who just is always stressed out is going to be like, no, there's no God, if that. But what if a person has a stressed out nature, but they're born in a, in a home that has a deep religious conviction about God and God's providence? You see what I'm saying? Or versus a person that, you know, maybe has less of a stressed nature, but they're kind of in a, in a home where they don't kind of think about there's a purpose and a plan and you just kind of have to fight to survive. Yeah, I'd See, love to know that. But yeah, that's, that's, the, that's question the question that we, yeah, yeah, that's the question. That's the question is, can you help your kids be more adjusted in life? So originally people said that religion was inversely associated with health, that if you're religious, it was a clutch, <laughs> people even in the 1980s. They said that religion was something that the weak people have to turn to for their, you know, because they're de they're deficient. They're psychologically deficient. So in the 1990s, there was a very famous psychologist, and he was Kenneth Pargament, and he decided the obvious. He said, you guys have stated a theory. The theory is that people who are less healthy will choose religion. But you've never tested your theory. That's not the sign of a good researcher. Let's test your theory to see what actually is going on in practice. So he did actual psychological experiments with no agenda. He wasn't a religious person. He just wanted to see. Now this man has published two books and over 150 scientific papers. He usually rewards for the American Psychological Association, American Psychiatric Association. And what he showed was that spirituality is an important resource for people in times of stress. And connection with God can alleviate symptoms of stress, worry, and depression. Okay? And that it's not indicative of poor emotional health. Okay. In fact, after reviewing this, the atheist, the, the, the Ellis person that had said otherwise, okay, he publicly retracted his statement. And he said that from a psychological standpoint, religion is not necessarily a bad thing. Okay, you know, it's not a, is it a good thing? Okay, I'm not saying it's a good thing. But I can't say with conviction that religion is a bad thing. So, if you look around, this might answer a very interesting puzzle. How come, maybe another reason why, the levels of stress and anxiety and the number of people taking prescription medications for anxiety, for depression, for stress, for pain, has skyrocketed. Do you guys understand that? The number of people that are self-medicating Self-medicating, with the doctor's help, medicating. Because they are experiencing a tremendous internal state of conflict and stress and, right, has skyrocketed. Okay, what are the numbers? Oh, listen to this. So, a clinical uh, professor in psychology at Cornell University named Robert <laughs> Leary, he pointed out in an interview with Dennis Prager, okay, this guy's a Cornell guy like me, Listen to what he said. If this doesn't keep you up at night, I don't know what will. <laughs> he said, we're experiencing a major historic trend in the increase 
in anxiety. Ready? The average child, the average child today between the ages of 11 and 13 is as anxious as the average psychiatric patient was in the 1950s. Should I say that again? Should I say that again? Because when I read that, I was... He says, the average child today between the ages of 11 and 13 is as anxious as the average psychiatric patient was in the 1950s. He also noted there's research that shows that people having a belief system in a community that supports them actually have a better and happier life. Okay? This is a Cornell guy. He's not necessarily a religious guy. So what's happened to the prescription rates for mood-altering medications in the past 20 years? What do you guys think? Uh, what? Uh, what? Okay. So I'm more advanced. Okay, more advanced. And then more drugs. More drugs. And the number of people taking them in the last between, I have, it's this, between 1994 and 2002, the number of people taking these types of drugs in America doubled. Okay, doubled. The number of people taking psych psychotropic medications tripled in the same decade. Now, is it a good thing to take medication? What's some of the side effects of taking this type of medication? Dependence. Okay, dependence. Kind of dependence. Absolutely. What? Depends what kind of medication. Decrease libido. Decrease libido. <laughs> Not that's <laughs> guys. These things. Look at the packages. Look at the boxes. I mean, look at them. Look at the commercials. It's like Wonder Drug, and then at the end, it's like by the way, by the way. You're going to have diarrhea, vomiting, high blood pressure, right? right? These things have serious medical side effects in your body. You know, really, I was learning with a donor today, and he was telling me how one of his friend's sons just died of an overdose of cocaine in Manhattan. Okay? Just died of, a, of an overdose. Like, what caused him to take that much cocaine? <laughs> what, what was it? That, you know, like what caused him to take that much cocaine? He died. He's dead. Right? A nice Jewish boy. These are Jewish kids. Okay, this happened four months ago. He said. <clears throat> Just happened four months ago. Yeah, it's a crazy thing. So look, these things have ter a lot of serious side effects. Um, you know. And I'm not saying that people that actually have a chemical imbalance should not take chemicals to balance them. I think people should. This is not talking about a chemical imbalance. This is talking about people that have been exposed to chronic stress, chronic comparisons with everyone else, chronic insecurity, chronic, you know, chronic judgment, chronic pressure, chronic expectations to the point where they literally have to take something to calm themselves down to feel normal. I'm dealing with this a lot, guys. There's a lot of guys that smoke a lot of pot. And I'm dealing with this in relationships, is that the girls find the guy, the guy's great, and the guy really is great. Then they find out this guy, like, you know, likes to smoke, right? And they're thinking to themselves, really? Now, I know there's some girls out there that like to smoke, but I'll tell you that 99% of them, as soon as they get serious about life or relationship, kids are like, it's out the window. Never to be thought of again. It's just like, whatever. Are guys like that necessarily? <laughs> so they're like, okay, like, let's have kids. The guys are like, sure, you know? And, and they're like, so you're gonna stop smoking? And the guy's like, what? <laughs> what, why, what do you mean? Like, what does that have to do with anything? And they're like, you mean the father of my kid is gonna like be sneaking pot in the bathroom? Like, I don't understand <laughs> what you mean here. And I'm dealing with these great girls, with these great guys, and this is a conflict in their relationship. It's a challenge, right? And the guys are using this in order to de-stress, in order to cope, in order to feel like normal, so they can actually feel connected and feel present and feel normal because, because they're just bombarded all the time. Is it right? Same with alcohol. Alcohol's, alcohol's bad too, yeah. So what do you tell them? Do you see? 
just cut it out, find other ways to deal with stress. Okay. Yes. <laughs> find other ways to deal with stress. And that's really what this class is all about. Is looking at other ways of dealing with stress. And not having to resort to things which could have disastrous consequences like death or serious side effects like nausea, vomiting, and sexual dysfunction or destroy your relationship because you're stuck in, in, in a you know, with a habit that's very, you know, that's very uh, questionable. Okay? Question. Yeah. Okay, how about exercise and sex? Sex with your girlfriend. That's a good way to do it. Yeah! Okay, so I know a guy that believed that. Okay? So tell me, how much does that have to do with sexuality? Using sex as a way of relieving tension. How much sexuality is in that? You, you love your girlfriend. How much sexuality is in that? How much sexuality is in that? How much intimacy? How much? How much intimacy is in that? There's physical intimacy in it, but you still love your girlfriend. It's like you're just doing it for nothing. It's a bonus. Guys, can girls can girls know the difference when you're doing this because it's a stress reliever versus it's an act of intimate connection? The girls know the difference. What do you think? Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 For sure. Look, I I'm, a, I'm like a marriage counselor. I literally have people coming to me for this issue. It's a disaster. A disaster. I'm, I'm like, maybe if you're like, you know, went around, whatever, and, but when you're with one person and you're trying to build something that can last forever, this is a disaster. Okay. What's this? I'm just like, I'm telling you real life situations. What, what's a disaster? That using your wife as your sexual tension release. <laughs> okay. As your punching bag, what? He had, he had two points, so one, oh, was, one was using exercise as well. Oh, exercise is great. Exercise is great. That's also a form of exercise. Uh, <laughs> 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 right, <brother. laughs> That's great. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. What? What? Like, what? If we're just like sex, would you like kind of stress me for her to do it? Yeah, women don't operate like that. They, they just continue to try to uh, okay, so. Yeah. I was actually going to say the same thing about the exercise and sex. Because physical, uh, it's a physical mental release. So I did not say that sex doesn't release anxiety. It does. What did I say? No, 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 no. I, I agree. I, it's uh, not the go to. Uh, I'm not worried yeah. about that. What I'm saying is. Trying to find alternatives. But that's a physical. That's a physical. So as far as like mental religions, just no physical physicality involved. And what you're saying is that spirituality and religion is the ultimate? Ultimate. Well, let's get there. Let's see how we get there. Um, OK, so basically, this guy that I started with, David Rose Barron, he worked on a PhD for Harvard, right? Um, he published numerous studies and national conferences about the relation between religion, spirituality, and stress, anxiety, and depression. And what they have found is that trust in God, as well as religious practices like prayer and study and attending prayer services, is associated unequivocally with lower levels of psychological distress. This is a fact. Not saying you're stress-free, but comparatively, basically where you're lower. Yeah. Isn't uh, stress, you get stressed from like like having more responsibilities and like adding more burden. So wouldn't religion cause more burden and more responsibility? You get stressed and by add more how stress? you look at life and how you handle what's coming at you. That's what causes stress. So if, right, so if this is something which changes how you look at life and resets and reframes your life, then that would diminish. So it could, it could add stress if you have the wrong perspective. If you're OCD and you use religion as your next OCD outlet, it will increase your stress, right? If you're like, God, I dominate 18 times a day, right? Like, I missed a word, I missed a word, I think I missed a word, I don't know if I missed a word, I better do it again, and again, I better, even, you know? Even if you're not OCD, but the fact that you have to wake up for chakras and put on to fill in, there's a lot but of again, obligations. again, these are the rituals that ground you into a positive, connected state of well-being, then that does not add stress, 
that actually eliminates, alleviates the stress. If these are your rituals which get you into the healthy, stress-free place. That's very, like, mindset. Absolutely. Always. Always, always, always. Those are the deeply most, the people that held the most deep religious beliefs. Not the ones that just did, did the acts. Right? But they actually really... Okay, so... <laughs> So Dave Roseman de, de, kind of concludes, with the financial markets in crisis, with growing security concerns around the world, stress and we have gone through the roof, particularly in Jewish communities, we are under siege, right? And interestingly, increasing belief in God may help to decrease that distress. So we now have evidence that there is a very powerful antidote the stress in our lives, which comes through religious belief and practice. So let's talk about it. What does that mean? What does that look like? How do I incorporate that into my life? How is that going to change me? How could that help me? So what does that look like, personally, practically? There goes a time where, uh, throughout the day, I thank God for almost anything that happens. Just okay. small little things. So how did that influence your day? Uh, it takes away the pressure. Like you're dealing with, let's say, the worst of cases are just something small. So when you're dealing with the uncertainty of what's going to happen, and I say, like, I think I have God in mind. I just like, it's off my shoulder. You know, it is what it is. So you're saying acceptance, and acceptance creates serenity. Yeah. Yes, you understand? Pretty much. Yeah. So guys, imagine you wake up in the morning, right? You get out of bed. You realize the alarm didn't go off. You're half an hour late. You're stressed out. You go downstairs, right? The coffee. You're out of coffee. You're going to die without your coffee. Like, you're going to die. You, you go out, outside. You go down the steps. You trip down the steps. You sprain your ankle. You're cursing. You're screaming, right? You limp to the car, you're late, you're freaking out, you got this meeting, get in the car, you forgot to fill up the gas, you're out of gas. Okay, it's like, ah, I call a triple, okay. Now, imagine what happened. How would we experience that? I mean, I would be probably reduced to a puddle on the floor, you know, at this point. Guys, you want to talk? You want to talk? Thank you. Puddle on the floor. Now imagine, imagine that you knew that this particular day you were being filmed for Father of the Year, okay? And there was like cameras in your house and they don't want to be intrusive, they just kind of wanted to be anonymous, right? It's hidden cameras. And like this was the day that you were going to be filmed, right? So that they could publicize what an incredible family man you are. So you get up. Half an hour late. How do you respond? It's okay. Okay, right? It's going to be okay. Go downstairs. What happens? The coffee. No coffee. How do you respond? Honey, we need some more coffee. Please put it on the list, right? I'll go get some on my way to work, right? Walk down the stairs, ah, pfft, trip. How do you respond? How do you respond? Right, the cameras are rolling. How do you respond? Last. Right, ah, 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 no. Ah, man, I gotta fix that step. All right, you know, let's, let's, let's take on the day. Every challenge, I can conquer it, right? One more thing. Right, get in the car, it's out of gas. Right, again. Right, I'm amazing, I'm resourceful, cold AAA, right? Yeah, you would actually be able to do that. Interestingly enough, you would be able to do that, every single one of us. When you feel that there's some kind of a plan and that what you're doing is meaningful and matters and who you show up as, is a connection, it's about a connection, it's about love, it's about a relationship. And that everything that's happening for you is a kind of a test to see if you can overcome your lower nature and if you can show up as your best self. If you knew that right now 
you were being tested to see if you could overcome your lower nature and show your best self, and something happened, would you win? Would you do it? If you knew that right now this was the test that your job was going to ride on, whether or not they're going to give you that job, they're going to throw a test at you, and you found out. And it's about whether or not you're going to overcome this lower nature, which is a situation, a stress test, you're going to, whether you're going to overcome it or not. Would you overcome it? If you know, would you overcome it? Absolutely, with style, with flair. There's an amazing story that Charlie Harari told. It was a guy, he was a commander, or he was trying to become a commander in the Israeli army. And it was time for the test. The test is the following. You have your, your platoon, your battalion of soldiers. You have to get them safely from point A to point B. And there's going to be all kinds of surprises and attacks. you got to get them there. And when you get to the destination, you have to open this door. Okay? You have to open the door. Once you get through that door, you have succeeded and you have a time limit. You have exactly one hour. So the first day, okay, it's time. He was up all night. He was so nervous. He's so excited. It's what he's won all of his life. He's going to become a commander of the Israeli army. He gets his platoon, he gets his tanks, he gets his jeeps, right? They're setting off, and all of a sudden, poof, one of the tires in the jeeps blows. And the people have heavy equipment, right? They can't move on. He doesn't know what to do. Should he just jump to the end, or does he, does he deal with right? He decides he's going to deal with the situation, right? He gets the thing back going, gets them all together, everyone's back, everyone's going forward. Right? He sees the door. They're running, running, running. He jumps to the door, and it's locked. That means that he missed the time. He missed it by a few minutes. He's not going to be a commander. It's over. He lost his chance. You don't get a second chance. Okay? Everything he's worked for all these years, he blew it. So the Israeli officials come to him. He say, I'm sorry. Yeah. Say, so, you know what, listen, maybe we can make an exception with you. Maybe we can give you another chance. You missed it by minutes. And something happened that really was beyond your control. You know what, we're going to petition and see if we can get you another chance. And they come back to him and they say, we actually were able to do something unprecedented. You have a second chance. Okay, so it's scheduled for a week. The days tick by. Finally, it's the night before. Morning comes. He's got his platoon. He's got his tanks. He's got his jeeps. He's on the road, right? The attack from this net. Everything's going great. All of a sudden, psh, one of the soldiers falls down. Looks like his leg is broken. He can't go on. What do you do? Do you leave him there and keep running? Or do you grab him? Do you take him? Do you slow everyone down to make sure he comes along with the run? So what did he do? He grabbed the guy, right, hamper, ran to the finish line, got to the door, it's locked. He blew it the second time. He pulled it, there's no way. He blew it again. So the commanders come to him and they say, listen, again, it's like, this has never happened. But again, you missed it by like seconds this time. And some guy broke his leg at the last minute, right? It's not, it's uncanny, like, but we're going to see if we can get you one more chance. But we can get, like, that's it, one more chance. And they end up getting him one more chance. So the days go by, and finally it's the night before, and this guy is like eaten up with anxiety, like everything for years. And he's failed twice, and he's just like traumatized by this experience, and he's like, ah, what are we going to do tomorrow? He wants to give up, he wants to quit, he wants to attack it and jail, he wants to give up, it's like all over the place. And all of a sudden, he can't sleep, he's up all night, all of a sudden, in the middle of the night, a thought occurs to him. You know what the thought was? What is the chances that just, just happened by chance? What are the odds that twice something unpredictable happened, and I ended up missing it by second. What's the odds? This doesn't make sense. 
And he thought to himself, what's going on? What's going on? What's the message? What am I supposed to learn from this? And all of a sudden, he got it. He got it. He knew what he had to do. So the next day, tanks, right? The jeeps, the battalion, going, going, going. All of a sudden, something totally out of the order to happen. So they're going to right. And he says, come on, we don't leave any man behind. And he grabs the guy, and they all get ready. They order, and they get to the door, and they open the door. And he knows now, he knows he's beyond the time. Right? The clock is there. He knows he's late. He knows the door's locked. Gets the door. He pulls in the handle, and it opens. And they say, congratulations. You've become a commander of the Israeli army. No commander in the Israeli army ever leaves a man behind. That's what it means to be a Jew. You never leave a man behind. You are one with your unit. And you passed the test. The test wasn't whether or not you got there the fastest. The test was whether or not you succumbed to the stress and the temptation to take shortcuts and value your accomplishment over human life. And what it means to be an Israeli officer is you value human life first. And congratulations, you passed the test. And he knew it. And he passed it because he had it. He knew it. He understood that there was a plan, that there was a desire, that he had to be his best self to pass this test of life, not his lower self. And he became a commander. We all have many situations. We have blowouts in our lives. We have many situations that resemble this test that this officer went through. The question really is, what's the test? What's causing the stress? How do you respond to the stress? When you have a belief system, when you have a sense of self that's based on a higher experience of self, based on being your best self, based on a religious conviction that everything is happening for a reason, and everything is here to give you situations where you can choose to be your best self, to create the most powerful self in life that you can be, when you live like that, that everything has a plan, everything's happening for the good, then you look at life completely differently. You can pass a test if you know it's a test. And you understand that the test is really who am I being? Who am I, how am I being in this world? And the test is being my best self. If you know already that your life is a series of challenges which is designed to help you achieve your greatness, to be your best self in this world, and you look at life completely differently. It's not just random. It's not just life is beating you down and there's so much to do. It's not about any of that stuff out there. It's not about any of that stuff out there. Where is it? What's it all about? What's happening in here? That's the test. What's happening in here? That all that stuff is just to help me become what's supposed to be happening here. That's a religious belief system. Okay? And that is the best recipe I can offer you for your career, for your life, for your marriages. To harmonize with another human being is to see them as also an agent in helping you become your best. Okay? That's what it's all about. So how do we deal with all of the stress that's faced in our lives? What's the best, best formula? No side effects. Right? Only positive side effects. Very positive side effects. So the Torah says it's called emunah. It's called what's called trust. Trust in God. Understanding that everything that's happening to you is happening for a reason. It's all for your good. It's coming from love. And it's all to bring out your best. That's what life is. That's the Jewish consciousness. That's what we've survived for so many years was resiliency, which we always step, land on our feet. We're enslaved, Holocaust, next thing you know, we're cybers building the state of Israel. How come we don't keep that slave mentality? How come? We don't get beaten down. How come? We always come back. We're always alive. How come? How come? 
because we're connected to the, source, to the source of life, we know that it's always about overcoming obstacles to stay connected and growing and, and, and fully free in the life. That's what it's all about. And that's how we've accomplished so much of Jewish people. They've done it in such an incredible way. So Torah offers us a prescription how to look at the world in, I would say, the most healthy, balanced approach to make sure that you can still stay very grounded in yourself and in your life and what's happening around you, but you can also bring down your higher sense of self and sensitivities in a way that you can really have a choice. Who do I want to be? How do I want to show up in this life, in this world? So the antidote to stress is a moon period. It's the answer. Someone's got your back, all for a reason. Okay? Everything that's happening in the world can change. So I'll end with one last story. The story actually happened to me probably about 15 years ago. I was in Jerusalem. I was studying at the Eish Yeshiva. I'd been there for a few years already. Um, and my sister called me, trembling voice. She said, it's Dad. I said, what happened? She goes, he passed out. He's at the hospital now. He can't speak. He's incoherent. It's serious. I said, I'm on the next plane. I was home within, you know, 24 hours. I was in New York at the hospital. So the doctors narrowed it down that my father either had a brain tumor or he had a bacterial infection in his brain, the same one that causes strep throat. Guys, what happens to your throat when you have the strep throat bacteria in your throat? What happens to your throat? Sore throat. Okay, so that's what was happening to his brain potentially. So either it was a tumor or an infection <laughs> of his brain. Those were the two options. There wasn't a third good option. There was two bad options. Which option was worse? They said the tumor was worse. Okay, because the bacterial infection can be treated by antibiotics. He would have to be on an IV drip for six months straight. Okay, and carry around with him everywhere he goes for six months, but it's treatable. So here I am at the hospital, okay? He gets wheeled in, you know those big things with like the drill where they're gonna like actually take tissue from your brain? You guys ever see those in the movies? So my dad is getting wheeled in with this like brain surgery apparatus. They're gonna take tissue to uh, biopsy in order to see whether or not this is bacterial or whether it's, it's uh, cancerous. So here I am in the hospital, in Manhattan, overlooking the Hudson River on probably like the 35th floor, like super high up, looking out over the world, over the river. And I pray, let it be an infection, right? Like, let it be a brain infection. Please, God, infection, 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 infection. Not a cancer, infection, infection, right? Very weird thing to pray, that your father would have a brain infection. But at the moment, it would have made sense, right? So the most incredible thing happened to me. All of a sudden, all of my fear, all of my anxiety, everything lifted. And the following thought came into my, my head, in my heart. It said, whether or not it's a tumor or a brain infection, either way, it is a manifestation of a loving God. It is something sent by a loving God. And all of a sudden, I just had this unbelievable sense of peace and serenity that there's one option I would for sure prefer, but I know whatever happens, it's coming for love. It's coming for love. And it's going to, and somehow, there's a bigger plan that's going to right, make it all make sense. At that exact moment, the doctor came out and announced it was an infection. At that exact moment, we didn't know, it could have been an hour, two hours. He said it's an infection, it's an infection, right? And I, to this day, know and believe that my prayer and then my shift in consciousness, which recognized that it was all for the good, helped create that reality. There was no need to give me that harder test when I already had experienced the serenity of 
of understanding. And I would have passed, even if it was the other test, I would have passed at this point. There was no point in giving me that test, because I had passed it. And with that, my dad was on IV for six months, literally six months. Everywhere he went, it was a portable IV. And he's actually recovered 100%. 100% recovered. Okay? Amazing story. So that was probably one of the most crazy, stressful times in my life. In my life. In my life. And instead of crumbling into anxiety and security, I found the most incredible strength. The most incredible strength you can imagine. And I think that that's just illustrative of what it means to live a life with faith. To live a life with, and this is not like deluding yourself that something is happening that isn't happening or vice versa. It's being in reality. You know what's happening. It's not saying this isn't happening. You know what's happening. But it's looking at how to deal with it in the most resourceful, the best way, and understanding that ultimately it's all coming for a reason, for a purpose, and for the good. So I give everyone a blessing that we should all develop the inner resources and the convictions to live life on such an elevated state that we can really, really, really see God's hand behind everything in our lives and see everything as a loving gift from an infinite God. Everything in our lives is there to teach us and help us grow. And that by understanding that and living that way, that it should actually start to manifest. Because it says that when we turn to God in that way, God reveals his that he's acting in that way. And when we say that we trust other things, we trust the money, we trust the boss, we trust other things, then God says, all right, great, right, trust them. Choose who you trust. And the more we choose to trust God, the more that God reveals. And believe me, who do we want to be in control of our lives? Our boss or God? Who has better intentions for us? Who wants the best for right? The more that we put the trust in God, the more that we start to see how our life starts to revolve around a loving God and messages from a loving God to help us grow. Thank you very much.